Chapter 10. The New Pangea. Myotis, Lucipagus. The best time to take a bat census is the dead of winter. Bats are what are known as true hibernators. When the mercury drops, they begin looking for a place to settle down, or really upside down, since bats are in torpor hang by their toes. In the northeastern United States, the first bats to go into hibernation are usually the little browns. Sometime in late October or early November, they seek out a sheltered space, like a cave or a mine shaft, where conditions are likely to remain stable. The little browns are soon joined by the tricolored bats and then by the big browns and the small footed bats. The body temperature of a hibernating bat drops by 50 or 60 degrees, often to right around freezing. Its heart rate slows, its immune system shuts down, and the bat, dangling by its feet, falls into a state close to suspended animation. Counting hibernating bats demands a strong neck, a good hand lamp, and a warm pair of socks. In March 2007, some wildlife biologists from Albany, New York, went to conduct a bat census at a cave just west of the city. This was a routine event, so routine that their supervisor, Al Hicks, stayed behind at the office. As soon as the biologists arrived at the cave, they pulled out their cell phones. They said, holy shit, there's dead bats everywhere. Hicks, who works for New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, would later recall. Hicks instructed them to bring some carcasses back to the office. He also asked the biologists to photograph any live bats they could find. When Hicks examined the photos, he saw that the animals looked as if they had been dunked nose first in talcum powder. This was something he had never encountered before, and he began emailing the photographs to all bat specialists he could think of. None of them had ever seen anything like it either. Some of Hicks' counterparts in other states took a joking tone. What they wanted to know, they said, was what those bats in New York were snorting. Spring arrived. Bats all across New York and New England awoke from their torpor and flew off. The white powder remained a mystery. We were thinking, oh boy, we hope that just goes away, Hicks told me. It was like the Bush administration, and like the Bush administration, it just wouldn't go away. Instead, it spread. The following winter, the same white powdery substance was found on bats in 33 caves in four different states. Meanwhile, bats kept dying. In some hibernacula, populations plunged by more than 90%. In one cave in Vermont, thousands of corpses dropped from the ceiling and piled up the ground like snowdrifts. The bat die-off continued the following winter, spreading to five more states. It continued the winter after that in three additional states. And although in many places there are hardly any bats left to kill off, it continues to this day. The white powder is now known to be a cold living fungus, what's known as a psychrophile that was accidentally imported to the U.S., probably from Europe. When it was first isolated, the fungus from the genus Geomyces had no name. For its effect on the bats, it was dubbed Geomyces destructens. Without human help, long-distance travel is for most species difficult, bordering on impossible. This fact was, to Darwin, central. His theory of de descent with modification demanded that each species arise at a single place of origin. To spread from there, it either slithered or swam or loped or crawled or cast its seeds upon the wind. Given a long enough time, even a sedentary organism, like, say, a fungus, could, Darwin thought, become widely dispersed. But it was the limits of dispersal that made things interesting. These accounted for life's richness and, at the same time, for the patterns that could be discerned amid the variety. The barriers imposed by the oceans, for instance, explain why vast tracts of South America, Africa, and Australia, though in Darwin's words entirely similar in climate and topography, were populated by entirely dissimilar flora and fauna. The creatures on each continent had evolved separately, and in this way, physical isolation had been transmuted into biological disparity. Similarly, the barriers imposed by land explained why the fish of the eastern Pacific were distinct from the fish of the western Caribbean. Though these two groups were, as Darwin wrote, separated only by the narrow but impassable Isthmus of Panama. On a more local level, the species found on one side of a mountain range or a major river were often different from the species found on the other, though usually and significantly they were related. Thus, for example, Darwin noted, the plains near the Straits of Magellan are inhabited by one species of ray, and northward the plains of La Plata by another species of the same genus and not by a true ostrich or emu like those found in Africa and Australia. The limits of dispersal concern Darwin in another way, too, this one harder to account for. 
As he'd seen firsthand, even remote volcanic islands like the Galapagos were full of life. Indeed, islands were home to many of the world's most marvelous creatures. For his theory of evolution to be correct, these creatures must be the descendants of colonizers. But how had the original colonizers arrived? In the case of the Galapagos, 500 miles of open water separated the archipelago from the coast of South America. So vexed was Darwin by this problem that he spent over a year trying to replicate the conditions of an ocean crossing in the garden of his home in Kent. He collected seeds and immersed them in tanks of salt water. Every few days, he dredged out some of the seeds and planted them. The exercise proved time-consuming, for he wrote to a friend, The water I find must be renewed every other day, as it gets to be, to smell horribly. But the results, he thought, were promising. Barely seeds still germinated after four weeks immersion. Crest seeds after six, though the seeds gave out a surprising quantity of slime. If an ocean current flowed at the rate of roughly one mile per hour, then over the course of six weeks, a seed could be carried more than a thousand miles. How about an animal? Here, Darwin's methods became even more baroque. He sliced off a pair of duck's feet and suspended them in a tank filled with snail hatchlings. After allowing the duck's feet to soak for a while, he lifted them out and had his children count how many hatchlings were attached. The tiny mollusk, Darwin found, could survive out of water for up to 20 hours, and in this length of time, he calculated, a duck with its feet attached might cover six or even 700 miles. It was no mere coincidence, he observed, that many remote islands have no native mammals, save for bats, which can fly. Darwin's ideas about what he termed geographical distribution had profound implications some of which would not be recognized until decades after his death. In the late 19th century, paleontologists began to catalog the many curious correspondences exhibited by fossils gathered on different continents. Mesosaurus, for example, is a skinny reptile with splayed out teeth that lived during the Permian period. Mesosaurus remains turned up both in Africa and an ocean away in South America. Gosloptorus is a tongue-shaped fern, also from the Permian period. Its fossils can be found in Africa, in South America, and in Australia. Since it was hard to see how a large reptile could have crossed the Atlantic or a plant both the Atlantic and the Pacific, vast land bridges extending for several thousand miles were invoked. Why these ocean-spanning bridges had vanished and where they had gone, to no one knew. Presumably, they had sunk beneath the waves. In the early years of the 20th century, the German meteorologist Alfred Wegener came up with a better idea. The continents must have shifted, he wrote. South America must have lain alongside Africa and formed a unified block. The two parts must then have become increasingly separated over a period of millions of years like pieces of a cracked ice flow in water. At one time, Wegener hypothesized all of the present-day continents had formed one giant supercontinent, Pangaea. Wegener's theory of continental drift, widely derided during his lifetime, was, of course, to a large extent vindicated by the discovery of plate tectonics. One of the striking characteristics of the Anthropocene is the hash it's made of the principles of geographic distribution. If highways, clear cuts, and soybean plantations create islands where none before existed, global trade and global travel do the reverse. They deny even the remotest islands their remoteness. The process of remixing the world's flora and fauna, which began slowly, along the roots of early human migration has, in recent decades, accelerated to the point where in some parts of the world, non-native plants now outnumber native ones. During any given 24-hour period, it is estimated that 10,000 different species are being moved around the world just in a ballast of water. Thus, a single supertanker, or for that matter, a jet passenger, can undo millions of years of geographic separation. Anthony Riccardi, a specialist in introduced species at McGill University, has dubbed the current reshuffling of Earth's biota a massive invasion event. It is, he has written, without precedent in the planet's history. As it happens, I live just east of Albany, relatively close to the cave where the first piles of dead bats were discovered. By the time I learned about what was going on, white nose syndrome, as it had become known, had spread as far as West Virginia and had killed something like a million bats. I called up Al Hicks, and he suggested since it was once again bat census season that I tog along for their next count. On a cold, gray morning, we met up in the parking lot not far from his office. From there, we headed almost due north to the Adirondacks. About two hours later, we arrived at the base of the mountain. 
not far from Lake Chaplin. In the 19th century, and then again during World War II, the Adirondacks were a major source of iron ore, and shafts were sunk deep into the mountains. When the ore was gone, the shafts were abandoned by people and colonized by bats. For the census, we were going to enter a shaft of what was once the Barton Hill Mine. The entrance was halfway up the mountainside, which was covered in several feet of snow. At the trailhead, more than a dozen people were standing around, stomping their feet against the cold. Most, like Hicks, worked for the New York State, but there were also a couple of biologists from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a local novelist who was doing research for a book into which he was hoping to weave a white-nosed subplot. Everyone put on snowshoes, except for the novelist, who, it seemed, had missed the message to bring a pair. The snow was icy, and the going slow, so it took half an hour to get maybe half a mile. While we were waiting for the novelist to catch up, he was having trouble with the three-foot-deep drifts, the conversation turned to the potential dangers of entering an abandoned mine. These, I was told, included getting crushed by falling rocks, being poisoned by a gas leak, and plunging over a sheer drop of a hundred feet or more. After another half an hour or so, we reached the mine entrance, essentially a large hole cut to the hillside. The stones in front of the entrance were white with bird droppings, and the snow was covered with paw prints. Evidently, ravens and coyotes had discovered that the spot was an easy place to pick up dinner. Well, shit, Hicks said. Bats were fluttering in and out of the mine and in some cases crawling around on the snow. Hicks went to catch one. It was so lethargic that he grabbed it on the first try. He held it between his thumb and forefinger, snapped its neck, and placed it in a Ziploc bag. Short survey today, he announced. We unstrapped our snowshoes, put on helmets and headlamps, and filed into the mine, down a long, sloping tunnel. Shattered beams littered the ground, and bats flew up at him. Up at us through the gloom. Hicks cautioned everyone to stay alert. There's places that if you take a step, you won't be stepping back, he warned. The tunnel twisted along, sometimes opening up into a concert hall-sized chambers with side tunnels leading out of them. Some of the chambers had acquired names. When we reached the sepulchral stretch known as Don Thomas section, we split up into groups to start the survey. The process consisted of photographing as many bats as possible. Later on, back in Albany, somebody sitting at a computer screen would have to count all the bats in the pictures. I went with Hicks, who was carrying an enormous camera, and one of the biologists from the Fish and Wildlife Service, who had a laser pointer. Bats are highly social animals, and in the mine, they hung on the rock ceiling in crowded clusters. Most were little brown bats, Myotis lucificus, or lucis in a bat common jargon. These are the dominant bat in the northeastern U.S., and the sort most likely to be seen fluttering around on a summer night. As the name suggests, they're little, only about five inches long and two tenths of an ounce in weight, and brown, with light colored fur on their bellies. The poet Randall Jarrell described them as being the color of coffee with cream in it. Hanging from the ceiling, with their wings folded, they looked like damp pom-poms. There, there were also small-footed bats, Myotis lyagi, which can be identified by their very dark faces and Indiana bats, Myotis sodalis, which, even before white nose, were listed as an endangered species. As we moved along, we kept disturbing the bats, which squeaked and wrestled around like half-asleep children. Despite the name, white nose is not confined to bats' noses. As we worked our way deep into the mine, people kept finding bats with freckles of fungus on their wings and ears. Several of these were dispatched, for study purposes, with a thumb and forefinger. Each dead bat was sexed, males can be identified by their tiny penises, and placed in a Ziploc bag. Still today, it is not entirely understood how Geomyces destructans kills bats. What is known is that bats with white nose often make up from their torpor and fly around in the middle of the day. It's been hypothesized that the fungus, which, quite literally, eats away at the bat's skin, irritates the animals to the point of arousal. This, in turn, causes them to use up the fat stores that were supposed to take them through winter. On the edge of starvation, they fly out into the open to search for insects, which, of course, at that time of year are not available. It's also been proposed that the fungus causes the bats to lose moisture through their skin. This leads them to become dehydrated, which prompts them to wake up to go search for water. Again, they use up critical energy stores and wind up emaciated and finally, dead. We had entered the Barton Hill mine at around 1 p.m. By 7 p.m., we were almost back where we'd started at the bottom of the mountain, except that now we were on the inside of it. We came to a huge rusty winch, which when the mine was operational, had been used to haul ore to the surface. Below it, the path disappeared into a pool of water. 
black like the river stites, it was impossible to go farther, and so we begun the long climb up. The movement of species around the world is sometimes compared to Russian roulette, as in the high stakes game, two very different things can happen when a new organism shows up. The first, which might be called the empty chamber option, is nothing, either because the climate is unsuitable, or because the creature can't find enough to eat, or because it gets easier, it gets eaten itself, or for a host of other possible reasons. The new arrival doesn't survive, or at least fails to reproduce. Most potential introductions go unrecorded, indeed entirely unheeded, so it's hard to get precise figures. Almost certainly, though, the vast majority of potential invaders don't make it. In the second option, not only does the introduced organism survive, it gives rise to a new generation, which in turn survives and gives rise to another generation. This is what's known in the invasive species community as establishment. Again, it's impossible to say for sure how often this happens. Many established species probably remain confined to the spot where they were introduced, or they're so innocuous they go unnoticed. But, and here's where the roulette analogy comes back, a certain number complete the third step in the invasion process, which is spread. In 1916, a dozen strange beetles were discovered in a nursery near Riverton, New Jersey. By the following year, the insects, now known as Papilla japonica, or more commonly as Japanese beetles, had dispersed in all directions and could be found over an area of three square miles. The year after that, the figure jumped to seven square miles, and the year after that to 48 square miles. The beetle continued to expand its territory at a geometric rate, each year pushing out into a new concentric circle, and within two decades, it could be found from Connecticut to Maryland. It has since spread as far south as Alabama and as far west as Montana. Roy Van Driesch, an expert on invasive species at the University of Massachusetts, has estimated that out of every 100 potential introductions, somewhere between 5 and 15 will succeed in establishing themselves. Of these 5 to 15, one will in turn out to be the bullet in the chamber. Why some introduced species are able to proliferate explosively is a matter of debate. One possibility is that for species, as for grifters, there are advantages to remaining on the move. A species that's been transported to a new spot, especially on a new continent, has left many of its rivals and predators behind. This shaking free of foes, which is really the shaking free of evolutionary history, is referred to as enemy release. There are lots of organisms that appear to have benefited from enemy release, including purple loosestrife, which arrived in the northeastern United States from Europe in the early 19th century. In its native habitat, purple loosestrife has all sorts of specialized enemies, including the back margined loosestrife beetle, the golden loosestrife beetle, and the loosestrife root weevil and the loosestrife flower weevil. All of these were absent in North America when the plant appeared, which helps explain why it's been able to take over boggy areas from West Virginia to Washington State. Some of these specialized predators have recently been introduced into the U.S. in an effort to control the plant's spread. This sort of it-takes-an-invasive-to-catch-an-invasive strategy has a decidedly mixed record. In some cases, it's proven highly successful. In others, it's turned out to be another ecological disaster. To the later category belongs the Roby wolf snail, the rosy wolf snail, Euglandina rosea, rosea, which was introduced to Hawaii in the late 1950s. The wolf snail, a native of Central America, was brought in to prey on a previously introduced species, the giant African snail, Acatina polica, which had become an ag agricultural pest. Euglandina rosea mostly left Akatina folica alone and focused its attention instead on Hawaii's snail, small, colorful native snails. Of the more than 700 species of endemic snails that once inhabited the islands, something like 90% are now extinct, and those that remain are in steep decline. The corollary to leaving old antagonists behind is finding new native organisms to take advantage of. A particularly famous and ghastly instance of this comes in the long, skinny form of the brown tree snake. Boiga irregularis. The snake is nat native to Papua New Guinea and northern Australia, and has found its way to Guam in the 1940s, probably in military cargo. The only snake indigenous to the island is a small, sightless creature the size of a worm. Thus, Guam's fauna was entirely unprepared for Boiga irregularis and its voracious feeding habits. The snake ate its way through most of the island's native birds, including Guam flycatcher. 
Last seen in 1984, the Guam rail, which survives only owing to a captive breeding program, and the Mariana fruit dove, which is extinct on Guam, though it persists on a couple of other smaller islands. Before the tree snake arrived, Guam had three native species of mammals, all bats. Today, only one, the Mariana's flying fox, remains, and it is considered highly endangered. Meanwhile, the snake, also a beneficiary of enemy release, was multiplying like crazy. At the peak of what is sometimes called its eruption, population densities were as high as 40 snakes per acre. So thorough has been the devastation wrought by the brown tree snake that it has practically run out of native animals to consume. Nowadays, it feeds mostly on other interlopers, like the curious skink, a lizard also introduced to Guam from Papua New Guinea. The author David Quammen cautions that while it is easy to demonize the brown tree snake, the animal is not evil. It's just immoral and in the wrong place. What Boyga irregularis has done in Guam, he observed, is precisely what Homo sapiens has done all over the planet, succeeded extravagantly at the expense of other species. Without introduced pathogens, the situation is much the same. Long-term relationships between pathogens and their host are often characterized in military terms. The two are locked in an evolutionary arms race, in which, to survive, each must prevent the other from getting too far ahead. When an entirely new pathogen shows up, it's like bringing a gun to a knife fight. Never having encountered the fungus or virus or bacterium before, the new host has no defenses against it. Such novel interactions, as they're called, can be spectacularly deadly. In the 1800s, in the, 1800s the American chestnut was the dominant deciduous tree in eastern forests. In places like Connecticut, it made up close to half the standing timber. The tree, which can re-sprout from the roots, did fine even when heavily logged. Not only was baby cr baby's cribs likely made of chestnut, a plant pathologist named George Hepting once wrote, but chances were so was the old man's coffin. Then, around the turn of the century, Cryptonecteria parasita, parasita, the fungus responsible for chestnut blight, was imported to the U.S., probably from Japan. Asian chestnut trees, having co-evolved co with parasita, were easily able to withstand the fungus. But for the American species, it proved almost 100% lethal. By the, 1950, by the 1950s, it had killed off practically every chestnut in the U.S., some 4 billion trees. Several species of moss that depended on the tree disappeared along with it. Presumably, it's the novelty of the chytrid fungus that accounts for its deadliness as well. It explains why all of a sudden golden frogs disappeared from Thousand Frog Stream and why amphibians in general are the planet's most threatened class of organism. Even before the cause of white nose syndrome was identified, Al Hicks and his colleagues suspected an introduced species. Whatever was killing the bats was presumably something they never encountered before, since the mortality rate was so high. Meanwhile, the syndrome was spreading from upstate New York in a classic bullseye pattern. This seemed to indicate that the killer had touched down near Albany. Suggestively, when the dye off began to make national news, a spelunker sent Hicks some photographs he'd shot about 40 miles west of the city. The photos dated from 2006, a full year before Hicks' co-workers had called him to say, holy shit, and they showed the bats with clear signs of white nose. The spelunker had taken his pictures in a cave connected to Howie Caverns, a popular tourist destination which offers, among other attractions, flashlight tours and underground boat trips. It's kind of interesting that the first record we have of this photograph from Commercial Cave in New York that gets about 200,000 visits a year, Hicks told me. Introduced species are now so much a part of so many landscapes that chances are if you glance out your window, you will see some. From where I'm sitting in western Massachusetts, I see grass, which someone at some point planted, and which most definitely is not native to New England. Almost all the grasses in American lawns come from somewhere else, including Kentucky bluegrass. Since my lawn is not particularly well kept, I also see lots of dandelions, which came over from Europe and spread just about everywhere, and garlic mustard, also from Europe, and broadleaf plantains, yet another invader from Europe. Plantains, Plantago major, seem to have arrived with the very first white settlers and were such a reliable sign of their presence that the Native Americans refer to them as the white man's footsteps. If I get up from my desk and walk past the edge of the lawn, I can also find Maltiflora rose, a prickly invasive from Asia, Queen Ainsley, 
Anna's Lace, another introduction from Europe. Burdock, similarly from Europe. An oriental bittersweet, whose name speaks to its origins. According to a study of specimens in Massachusetts, Herb Herbaria, nearly a third of all plant species documented in the state are naturalized newcomers. If I dig down a few inches, I'll encounter earthworms, which are also newcomers. Before Europeans arrived, New England had no earthworms of its own. The region's worms had all been wiped out by the last glaciation, and even after 10,000 years of relative warmth, North America's native worms had yet to recolonize the area. Earthworms eat through the leaf litter and in this way dramatically alter the makeup of forest soils. Although earth earthworms are beloved by gardeners, recent research has linked their introduction to a decline in native salamanders in the Northeast. As I write this, several new and potentially disastrous invaders appear to be in the process of spreading in Massachusetts. These include, in addition to Geomyces destructans, the Asian longhorn beetle, an import from China that feeds on a variety of hardwood trees, the emerald ash borer, also from Asia, whose larvae tunnel through and thereby kill ash trees, and the zebra mussel, a freshwater import from Eastern Europe that has the nasty habit of attaching itself to any available surface and consuming everything in the water column. Stop aquatic, aquatic hitchhikers, declares a sign by a lake down the road from where I live. Clean all recreational equipment. The sign shows a picture of a boat entirely coated in zebra mussels, as if someone had mistakenly applied mollusk instead of paint. Wherever you are reading this, the storyline is going to be roughly the same. And this does not go just for other parts of the United States, but all around the world. DAISY, a database of invasives in Europe, tracks more than 12,000 species. APASD, the Asian Pacific Alien Species Database, FISNA, the Forest Invasive Species Network for Africa, IBIS, the Island Biodiversity and Invasive Species Database, and NEMESIS, the National Exotic Marine and Estuarine Species Information System, track thousands more. In Australia, the problem is so severe that for some, for severe that from preschool on, children are enlisted in the control efforts. The city council in Townsville, north of Brisbane, urges kids to conduct regular hunts for cane toads, which were purposely, albeit disastrously, introduced into the 1930s to control sugarcane beetles. Cane toads are poisonous and trusting native species, like the northern quaw, eat them and die. To dispose of the toads humanely, the council instructs children to cool them in a fridge for 12 hours, and then place them in a freezer for another 12 hours. A recent study of visitors to Antarctica found that in a single summer season, tourists and researchers brought with them more than 70,000 seeds from other continents. Already, one plant species, Hoa'ana, a grass from Europe, has established itself on Antarctica. Since Antarctica has only two native vascular plant species, this means that a third of its vascular plants are now invaders. From the standpoint of the world's biota, global travel represents a radically new phenomenon, and at the same time, a replay of the very old. The drifting apart of continents that Wegner deduced from the fossil record is now being reversed. Another way in which humans are running geologic history backward and at high speed. Think of it as a souped up version of plate tectonics, minus the plates. By transporting Asian species to North America, North American species to Australia, and Australian species to Africa, and European species to Antarctica, we are in effect reassembling the world into one enormous supercontinent, what biology sometimes refer to as the New Pangaea. Aeolus Cave, which is set into a wooded hillside in Dorset, Vermont, is believed to be the largest bat hyper hibernaculum in New England. It is estimated that before White Nose hit, nearly 300,000 bats, some from as far away as Ontario and Rhode Island, came there to spend the winter. A few weeks after, I went with Hicks to the Barton Hill Mine. He invited me to accompany him to Aeolus. This trip had been organized by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and at the bottom of the hill, instead of strapping on snowshoes, we all piled into snowmobiles. The trail zigged up the mountain in a series of long switchbacks. The temperature, about 25 degrees, was far too low for bats to be active, but when we parked in the entrance to the cave, I could see bats fluttering around. The most senior of the Vermont officials, Scott Darling, announced that before going any further, we'd all have to put on latex gloves and Tyvek suits. This seemed to me to be paranoid, a gesture out of the novelist's white-nosed subplot. Soon, however, I came to see the sense of it. 
Aeolus was created by a water flow over the course of thousands and thousands of years. To keep people out, people out, the Nature Conservancy, which owns the cave, was blocked off the entrance with huge iron slats. With a key, one of the horizontal slats can be removed. This creates a narrow gap that can be crawled or slithered through. Despite the cold, a sickening smell emanated from the opening. Half game farm, half garbage dump. The stone path leading to the gate was icy and difficult to get footing on. When it was my turn, I squeezed between the slats and immediately slid into something soft and dank. This, I realized, picking myself back up, was a pile of dead bats. The entrance chamber of the cave, known as Guana Hall, is maybe 30 feet wide and 20 feet high at the front. Toward the back, it narrows and slopes. The tunnels that branch off from there are accessible only by spunkers, and the tunnels that branch off from those are accessible only to bats. Peering into the Guana Hall, I had the sense I was starting staring into a giant gullet. The scene in the dimness was horrific. There were long icicles hanging from the ceiling, and from the floor, large knobs of ice rose up, like polyps. The ground was covered with dead bats. Some of the ice knobs, I noticed, had bats frozen into them. There were torpid bats roosting on the ceiling, and also wide awake ones, which would take off and fly by, or sometimes right into us. Why bat corpses pile up in some places, while in others they get eaten or in some other way disappear, is unclear. Hicks speculated that the conditions of Aeolus were so harsh that the bats didn't even make it out of the cave before dropping dead. He and Darling had planned to do a count of the bats in Guano Hall, but this plan was quickly abandoned in favor of just collecting specimens. Darling explained that the specimens would be going to the American Museum of Natural History so that there would be at least a, re be a record of the hundreds of thousands of lucids or northern long-eared and triclog bats that had once wintered the Aeolus. This may be one of the last opportunities, he said, in contrast to a mine, which has been around for at most a few centuries. Aeolus, he pointed out, has existed for millennia. It's likely that the bats have been hibernating there generation after generation since the cave's entrance was exposed at the end of the last ice age. That's what makes this so dramatic. It's breaking the evolutionary train chain, Darling said. He and Hicks began picking up dead bats off the ground. Those that were too badly decomposed were tossed back. Those that were more or less intact were sexed and placed into two quart plastic bags. I helped out by holding the bag for dead females. Soon it was full and another one was started. When the specimen count hit somewhere around 500, Darling decided that it was time to go. Hicks hung back. He would brought along his enormous camera and said that he wanted to take more pictures. In the hours he had been slipping around in the cave, the carnage had grown even more grotesque. Many of the bat carcasses had been crushed, and now there was blood oozing out of them. As I made my way up toward the entrance, Hicks called after me. Don't step on any dead bats. It took me a moment to realize he was joking. When exactly the new Pangaea project began is difficult to say. If you count people as an invasive species, the science writer Alan Burdick has called Homo sapiens arguably the most successful invader in biological history. The process goes back 120,000 years or so to the period when modern humans first migrated out of Africa. By the time humans pushed into North America around 13,000 years ago, they had domesticated dogs, which they brought with them across the Bering Land Bridge. The Polynesians, who settled Hawaii around 1,500 years ago, were accompanied not only by rats, but also by lice, fleas, and pigs. The discovery of the New World initiated a vast biological swap meet the so-called Columbian Exchange, which took the process to a whole new level. Even as Darwin was elaborating the principles of geographic distribution, those principles were being deliberately undermined by groups known as acclimatization societies. The very year on the origin of species was published, a member of the acclimatization society based in Melbourne released the first rabbits into Australia. They've been breeding there like, well, rabbits ever since. In 1890, a New York group that took as its mission the introduction and acclimatization of such foreign varieties of the animal and vegetable kingdom as might prove useful or interesting imported European starlings to the U.S. The head of the group supposedly wanted to bring to America all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare. A hundred starlings let loose in Central Park have by now multiplied to more than 200 million. Still today, Americans often deliberately import foreign varieties they think 
might prove useful or interesting. Garden catalogs are filled with non-native plants and aquarium catalogs with non-native fish. According to the entry on the pets in the Encyclopedia of Biological Invasions, every year more non-indigenous species of mammals, birds, amphibians, turtles, lizards, and snakes are brought into the U.S. than the country has native species of these groups. Meanwhile, as the pace and volume of global trade have picked up, so too has the number of accidental imports. Species that couldn't survive an ocean crossing at the bottom of a canoe or in the hold of a whaling ship may easily withstand the same journey in the ballast tank of a modern cargo vessel or the bay of an airplane or in a tourist suitcase. A recent study of non-indigenous species in North American coastal waters found that the rate of reported invasion has increased exponentially over the past 200 years. It attributed the accelerating pace to the increased quantities of goods being transported and also to the increased speed with which they travel. The Center for Invasive Species Research, which is based at the University of California, Riverside, estimates that California is now acquiring a new invasive species every 60 days. This is slow compared to Hawaii, where a new invader is added each month. For comparison's sake, it's worth noting that before humans settled Hawaii, new species seem to have succeeded in establishing themselves on the archipelago roughly once every 10,000 years. The immediate effect of all this reshuffling is a rise in what was called, might be called local diversity. Pick any place on Earth, Australia, the Antarctic Peninsula, your local park, and more likely than not, over the last few hundred years, the number of species that can be found in the area has grown. Before humans arrived on the scene, many whole categories of organisms were missing from Hawaii. These included not only rodents, but also amphibians, terrestrial reptiles, and ungulates. The islands had no ants, amphids, or mosquitoes. People have, in the sense, enriched Hawaii greatly. But Hawaii was, in its pre-human days, home to thousands of species that existed nowhere else on the planet. And many of these endemics are now gone or disappearing. The losses include, in addition to the several hundred species of land snails, dozens of species of birds, and more than a hundred species of ferns and flowering plants. For the same reason that local diversity has, as a general rule, been increasing, global diversity, the total number of different species that can be found on rock, has dropped. The study of invasives is often said to have begun with Charles Elton, a British biologist who published his seminal work, The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants, in 1958. To explain the apparently paradoxical effects of moving species around, Elton used the analogy of a set of glass tanks. Imagine that each of the tanks is filled with a different solution of chemicals. Then imagine every tank connected to its neighbors by long, narrow tubes. If the tapes to the tubes were left open for just a minute each day, the solutions would slowly start to diffuse. The chemicals would recombine, some new compounds would form, and some of the original compounds would drop out. It might, twink, it might take quite a long time before the whole system came into equilibrium, Elton wrote. Eventually, though, all of the tanks would hold the same solution. The variety would have been eliminated, which was just what could be expected to happen by bringing long, isolated plants and animals into contact. If we look far enough ahead, the eventual state of the biological world will become not more complex, but simpler and poorer, Elton wrote. Since Elton's days, ec ecologists have tried to quantify the effects of total global homogenization by means of a thought experiment. The experiment starts with the compression of all the world's land masses into a single megacontinent. The species area relationship is then used to estimate how much variety such a landmass would support. The difference between this figure and the diversity of the world as it actually is, is represents the loss implied by complete interconnectedness. In the case of terrestrial mammals, the difference is 66%, which is to say that a single continent world would be expected to contain only about a third as many mammalian species as concurrently exist. For land birds, it's just under 50%, meaning such a world would contain half as many bird species as the present one. If we look even farther ahead than Elton did, millions of years further, the biological world will, in all likelihood, become more complex again, assuming that eventually travel and global commerce cease. The new Pangaea will, figuratively speaking, begin to break up. The continents will again separate, and islands will be re-isolated. And as this happens, new species will evolve and radiate from the invasives that have been dispersed around the world. Hawaii, perhaps, will get giant rats, and Australia, giant bunnies. The winter after I had visited Aeolus with Al Hicks and Scott Darley, 
I went back with another group of wildlife biologists. The scene in the cave was very different this time around, but no less macabre. Over the course of the year, the piles of bloody bats had almost completely decomposed, and all that was left was a carpet of delicate bones, each no thicker than a pine needle. Ryan Smith of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and Susie von Odengen of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service were running the census this time around. They started with a cluster of bats hanging at the widest part of Guano Hall. On closer inspection, Smith noticed that most animals in the cluster were already dead, their tiny feet hooked to the rock in rigor mortis. But he thought he saw some living bats among the corpses. He called out the number to von Ottinger, who brought along a pencil and some index cards. Two Lucis, Smith said. Two Lucis, von Ottinger repeated, writing the number down. Smith worked the way deeper into the cave. Von Ottingen called me over and gestured toward a crack in the rock face. Apparently, at one point, there had been dozens of bats hibernating inside it. Now, there was just a layer of black muck stubbed with two thick sized bones. She recalled having seen on an earlier visit to the cave a live bat trying to nuzzle and nuzzle a ground of dead ones. It just broke my heart, she said. Bats' sociability has turned out to be a great boom of Geomyces destructings. In winter, when they cluster, infected bats transfer the fungus to uninfected ones. Those that make it until spring then disperse, carrying the fungus with them. In this way, Geomyces destructings pass us from bat to bat and cave to cave. It took Smith and Van Otten again only about 20 minutes to census nearly empty Guano Hall. When they were done, Von Ottingen tailed up the figures on her fit cards. 88 Lucis, 1 Northern long Bat, 3 Tricolored Bats, and 20 Bats of Indeterminate Species. The total came to 112. This was about a 30th of the bats that used to be counted in the hall in a typical year. You just can't keep up with that kind of mortality, Von Ottingen told me as we wriggled out through the opening in the slats. She noted that Lucius, Lucis pr- reproduced very slowly. Females produced only one pup per year. So even if some bats ultimately proved resistant to white nose, it was hard to see how populations could rebound. Since that winter, the winter of 2010, Geomyces destructens has been traced to Europe, where it appears to be widespread. The continent has its own bat species, for example, the greater mouse-eared bat, which is found from Turkey to the Netherlands. Greater mouse-eared bats carry white nose but don't seem to be bothered by it which suggests that they and the fungus evolved in tandem. Meanwhile, the situation in New England remains bleak. I went back to Aeolus for the count in the winter of 2011. Just 35 live bats were found in Guano Hall. I will return to the cave in 2012. After, after we'd hiked all the way up to the entrance, the biologist I was with decided it would be a mistake to go on. The risk of disturbing any bats that might be left outweighed the benefits of counting them. I hiked up again in the winter of 2013. By this point, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, white nose had spread to 22 states and five Canadian provinces and had killed more than 6 million bats. Although the temperature was below freezing, a bat flew up at me as I stood in front of the slats. I counted 10 bats clinging to the rock base around the entrance. Most of them had had the desiccated look of little mummies. The Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department has posted signs on two trees near the entrance to Aeolus. One said, this cave is closed until further notice. The other announced that violators could be fined up to $1,000 per bat. It was unclear whether the sign referred to living animals or the much more plentiful dead ones. Not long ago, I called Scott Darling to get an update. He told me that the little brown bat, once pretty much ubiquitous in Vermont, is now officially listed as an endangered species in the state. So too are northern long-haired and tricolored bats. I frequently use the word desperate, he said. We are in a desperate situation. As a brief aside, he went on. I read this news story the other day. A place called the Vermont Center for Eco Studies has set up this website. People can take a photo of any and all organisms in Vermont and get them registered on the site. If I had read that a few years ago, I would have laughed. I would have said, you're going to have people sending in a picture of a pine tree. And now, after what's happened with the little browns, I just wish they had done it earlier.